you and I agree that, and I, I just want to just stipulate to this, make sure there's no disagreement. If there is, it's fine. We'll, we'll just talk about it. But, but for the purposes of being aligned, I think you and I absolutely agree uh, that MAGA is a minority faction in the country that has the possibility to take power in a coalition with apathy, that it's an autocratic faction, that it is fascistic um, in character and nature, that it's dangerous, um, and that it's ascended uh, at some level, that it's spreading. What, what I would say to you, I mean, the answer to your question is Jim Jordan uh, is what the future of this looks like, right? That's what the metastasis is. And it has rendered the third oldest political party in the world, lock, stock, and barrel, controlled by Donald Trump and these people, into a nuthouse. And in a two-party system, um, you need two wings on the plane, proverbially, uh, so to speak. And all of the great achievements um, that you talked about, all of them, um, require bipartisan cooperation. You have, you know, one of the great heroes in the in the country's history was the Republican governor of New Hampshire, who was one of FDR's most ardent de New Dealers, um, John Winnan, who goes on to become the the U.S. ambassador to the U.K. during the, you know, during the Second World War. You look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I look for. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Republican governor of California, has delivered the most significant environmental achievement uh, of the 21st century as a matter of policy. And that was California's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, uh, the first major global warming legislation in the country, AB 32. You know, so that's the, you know, that's the question at hand, right, is, you know, the ability to look at the country as Americans and say, hey, it's the idea of the country that's being challenged here, you know, not a dispute over not a dispute over policies. And I guess, how do you evaluate how the Democratic Party's leadership is doing framing that, you know, framing that message right now? I mean, you have a lot of polls, incredibly, you know, three years on in a in a two team league uh, where the people were talking about here. Party of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, and Donald Trump are ahead. A couple different thoughts on this. I mean, it it's not sufficient, but I think it is necessary to mention that there is a material change to the texture of political debate since the Trump era, wherein it actually doesn't matter what Biden and Democrats do. They're starting with an even bigger deficit than, for example, George W. Bush did among Democrats before he did anything like we that happened under Bush, where there was a contingent of Democrats who would just say, no matter what, I don't approve of what the guy's doing that. I don't care what the facts are. Group is bigger than ever right now. So but that it's too simple to just say that's all that's going on. It is absolutely the case that even many Democrats don't know about some of the achievements of Joe Biden. You know, I'm starting to think about a segment for my show. I don't know exactly what shape it'll take, but something along the lines of, is Joe Biden the the best Democratic president, president of my lifetime by achievements? I mean, a lot of the things that even I didn't think he would do, uh, he's forgiven more student loan debt than any president in history by by number of dollars. CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, you don't have to like all this stuff. But from the point of view of achievements, this guy's gotten with a divided Congress a shocking amount of stuff done. I agree with having gotten out of Afghanistan. It was a mess. It would have been a mess if Trump did it, too. There's all of these things. And many Democrats have have trouble. And I'm not a Democrat, but I'm on the left, have trouble naming any of these things or even saying, well, I don't know, the economy is like kind of OK, maybe, but but it's not even really that great. So. I think you have to blame the Democratic Party for that to some degree. Maybe corporate media takes some responsibility for that. And there's a there's a real disconnect happening there. I'm going to analyze the poll, the accumulation of all the polls out there. Someone who's been around the track in a, in a couple of presidential campaigns. If we were sitting around in a meeting and in a political meeting right there, 
are people around that table who have a lot of different kind of views on policy and everything else. But from a campaign perspective, right, a, a fungal campaign is not a debating society. Um, it's a, it's trying to accomplish a goal. It has a it has a broad amount of people at the table. But 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 ideally, you want to be able to look at a set of facts, all right, in, in a condition and and say what we're going to do about it. So I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. George W. Bush, uh, as someone you know who knew him, you watch him. Anybody who looks at George W. Bush and is like, "That guy is stupid," I've always regarded as the mark of stupidity is the person who says that that out loud. Right? He's he's not a dumb guy by like any stretch of the imagination, and neither was Ronald Reagan. Right. And I think their writing and everything else proves and I understand the politics of it. And there was a cohort of the population, right, that these guys, these are dumb guys. Neither one of those campaigns, and I was I was part of one of them, ran a campaign trying to assert George Bush was the smartest guy in the country. He's a genius, in fact. And so I look at the Biden campaign, right? The first thing I see is they say, Ah, he's not old. He's the wisest guy in the land. And then I look at the polling. It's not what people believe. They, they have they have deep, deep worry about this. And so there's that. And so there are two things the American people are constantly told. The first is that the country is hopelessly and evenly divided. In fact, about 80% of the country, broad principles, agrees on solutions to immigration, guns, abortion, uh, even bigger numbers, broad dissatisfaction with healthcare industry, insurance companies, lots of room for common ground. And they're told over and over again, Countries right down the middle. Now, 80% of the country is saying, we don't want the Trump and Biden rematch. Don't want it. And so there's a lot of crossover in that. From left to right, uh, tall to short, <laughs> you know, skinny, skinny to heavy, right? A lot, lot of cross-section of America in that. The two political parties as institutions that were told never agree on anything. Well, as an observer sitting out here in California today, well, they agree on something, right? I mean, what they agree on is in a duopoly structure, right? You're going to get what you get and you're going to like it. And so here we sit in October, Trump slightly ahead. 80% of the country saying we don't want it. 80% of the Republicans on the stage, like automatons, right, saying to a question right after they condemn the guy for the insurrection. But yes, we'd be for him forever, no matter what, if he's if he's the nominee. What Joe Scarborough said, like on his show, is 100% true, right? That every single Democrat who comes on that show when the camera light goes off, they're like, I'm really worried about Biden's age. Right. And I've been in this meeting with them and this happened or this happened or that happened. But when the camera light goes on, it's all shut out. And I just mentioned that because I'm old enough to have been sitting watching that exact same thing happen in 2015 when I was sitting with all the Republicans. And so, like, there was a time when every Republican in America had the position I have on Trump. We all had it. When it ended, there were like 10 of us left. Right? <laughs> there were 10 of us left. So like, I look at that right now and I want, what is your reaction to that? Right? This yeah. idea, this belligerence in the political class that, you know, someone talks about primarying Biden, challenging Biden, right? Credible thing. It's not just the DNC that goes nuts, right? It's it's MSNBC that goes nuts, right? It's it's across the board. And I, I just 
what is the disconnect between the political and media elite? And I hate to use the elite because it's, but what's the disconnect here between the country and the people broadcasting from D.C. and New York, as you see it? Because it is profound. Well, I, I think there's a few different interesting things to talk about here. And one of the elements of this that isn't mentioned in the polls that I've seen, which would be, even if you think Biden's too old, are you still going to vote for him if he's on the ballot and the alternative is Trump or DeSantis? And I believe the answer is overwhelmingly the answer is yes. So, you know, I as I've talked about with my audience, I don't have any. For me, it is. Yeah. Right. For me, it is. Right. Sure. I, would, I mean, he could be in an he could be in a liquid oxygen tank. <laughs> right? Like, right. I mean, well, so so I think I think what that gets us to is. I would love to move to the next generation of leaders and have someone more energetic. I've talked about not necessarily on all policy, but in terms of style and ruthlessness in dealing with some of these crazies. I like Gavin Newsom's approach. I like Pete Buttigieg. There's a bunch of different people that I think would be, from a, from an optics perspective, way, way, way better. And so do I think Biden's too old? But in some sense, by the letter of the question, I guess I do. But obviously, I'm voting for him. And so I don't know it's, if it's so much about a disconnect. I think corporate center left media isn't willing to just say what I'm saying, which is, yes, this is true. And we're still better off with Biden. And so in order to keep up a certain appearance, they will just say and the Democrats will just say he's not too old, which is almost like a shortcut to he's too old, but we're still going to vote for him because it's the better option. I'm more comfortable saying it the way I see it. I think most of my audience is kind of on the same page. 